I'm joined this afternoon by Professor Christopher Huggins, who is with the School of International Development and Global Studies at the University of Ottawa. His article, The Political Economy of Land Law and Policy Reform in the Democratic Republic of Congo, an Institutional Bricolage Approach, was published by the Canadian Journal of Development Studies. Professor Chris, welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Oh, wonderful. I am very much happy. Thank you very much for doing this. I read your article twice last week, and uh, I read it again yesterday. This was a phenomenal job that you did. Keep up doing the good work, and uh, congratulations on your award of tenure at the University of Ottawa. Thank you. That, um, I appreciate that. Yeah, it does feel good to have, to have tenure. I feel very lucky as well to be a tenured uh, professor. You did a very good job. I have seen your CV. You know, it's well deserved. And I wish you all the best for uh, the work that uh, is coming for you in the future. I do have a lot of questions for you. This was interesting. And you know, as readers, we have our own understanding of what these articles advance. But sometimes this is spelled out differently by the author, which is something that you only get to understand when you interact with the scholar, you examine the strategies uh, that are used uh, by non-governmental uh, organizations, local non-governmental organizations in the Democratic Republic of Congo to influence and impact uh, land law and policy reform. There are so many reasons why these organizations are interested in shaping policy and impacting it. How did you conceive the idea for this article? And what do you consider to be the core ideas of it and its central argument. I should start by acknowledging the, the co-author uh, on this article, uh, Cristal Paluku Mastaki. Uh, I've known um, Cristal for, for many years. Uh, he uh, started off actually as um, uh, a member of civil society. He founded uh, an NGO in Eastern Congo, um, A de Action pour la Paix, A -A -A or AAP in, um, in English would be the acronym. Uh, and after founding this, um, this NGO, he then went on to work with um, the Global Land Tools Network, which is affiliated with UN Habitat, right? Um, so uh, he moved from, uh, from Goma in Eastern DRC, where he was based to, to Nairobi. Um, so at the time that we started to discuss this article, he was working with the Global Land Tools Network. Um, and you know, he was helping actually to uh, facilitate this land reform in the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is the subject of this article. So mm -hmm. he had a, a very detailed um, kind of practitioner knowledge of what was happening. Um, and just to, you know, to kind of start off, if you like talking about the core ideas, uh, to me, when we're uh, reading about some of these big processes like a land reform or other kinds of legal and policy changes in, in places like the DRC, quite often we get explanations uh, from you know, official reports, um, from the, the media, which are uh, brief, which are simplified, and which don't have a lot of the, the politics uh, in them. So quite often the kind of the negotiations, some of the kind of uh, awkward, you know, political dimensions and struggles are, are ignored um, or aren't really tackled. Um, so for me, you know, a role as an academic is to point out what are some of the, um, the difficulties, some of the obstacles, where are some of the points of, of tension uh, where are some of the disagreements? Um, because quite often, as I say, you know, for these big organizations, whether they're UN agencies or governments, um, quite often it's not in their interest, right, to point mm -hmm. out some of mm -hmm. these difficult aspects and these challenges. Yeah. Um, so really it was a conversation between myself and uh, Cristal Paluco Mastaki, um, which kicked off uh, this article in the first place. You've stayed in Rwanda and uh, you've stayed in Nairobi uh, where you have worked with uh, the Human Rights Watch, you have worked with the USAID, you have worked with UN agencies from the Democratic Republic of Congo. How different is it with the experiences of other countries in the continent? So I should say, um, most of my research experience, as you mentioned, has been in Eastern Africa, right? So uh, particularly, um, I did my PhD on the agricultural reform in Rwanda, which was also 
uh, linked to this uh, big, what they called a, a land regularization um, program, which is kind of like a land uh, registration program in, in Rwanda, which was seen as successful. Um, but in linking it to agricultural reform, I think there were quite a few challenges, which I looked at in my PhD and uh, I published a book about that as well. So I have the experience of um, Rwanda to compare it to. But of course, there are other places like Zimbabwe with its very well-known uh, fast track uh, land reform mm -hmm. and South Africa, of course, with its you know, very, again, well-known and very large scale effort mm -hmm. at land reform. So these are all, I think, very um, different kinds of experiences. Um, uh, so just to state the obvious, if we compare the, the DRC to Zimbabwe or uh, South Africa, there isn't quite the same kind of settler colonialism uh, history in in the DRC. Of course, there was you know a, a Belgian presence. There were uh, Belgian settlers who were engaged in um, farming and in mining, um, but there aren't uh, many Belgians really left. You know who are still mm -hmm. maintaining large amounts of land right in mm -hmm. in the DRC. Mm -hmm. um, so you know uh, the main dynamics in the DRC really are kind of post-conflict dynamics coming out of the, um, uh, what are sometimes called civil conflicts in the DRC. Yeah, yeah the, the first and the second Congo war. Yeah, but of course, uh -huh. as you know, they had major kind of international mm -hmm. dimensions too, with particularly mm -hmm. Uganda and Rwanda and other mm -hmm. countries being involved. So I think we have to see um, the land issues in um, Congo coming from this um, particular kind of Belgian colonial experience, um, but without that kind of uh, contemporary settler colonialism that you have in, in Southern Africa, um, but very much influenced by, you know, the weakening of um, institutions because of conflict. And the, um, I think there are strong links between control over land and resources in especially Eastern Congo and uh, continued kind of uh, political struggles today and violence today as well. So in that respect, it's quite different from, you know, the example of Rwanda, where right now you have a highly kind of um, securitized situation in Rwanda. Rwanda is also, of course, very, very small, whereas the DRC is a, is a huge country, right? It's very large. Mm -hmm. uh, quite sparsely populated considering its size. So I think the DRC is, um, it, it's quite particular, you know, and it's difficult to mm. compare it to other countries. Yeah. Um, its own history is, is very specific, of course. Mm. What explains the interests of local non-governmental organizations in shaping land reform policy? Crystal, as I said, my co-author has his own uh, experience uh, you know, having founded this NGO, working on land issues and helping people who have been displaced because of uh, conflict, but also because sometimes land grabbing and, and things like that. So, um, you know, the experience of his organization um, shows that there are kind of coalitions of different um, NGOs and community based organizations, particularly in Eastern Congo, which is um, the kind of part of the Congo which I know best, and especially uh, North Kivu um, is, is the area that I know best. Uh, there are a number of organizations working together. Um, there's one kind of umbrella organization, um, Forum des Amis uh, pour la Terre, if I remember correctly, kind of a forum for, you know, friends uh, of, the, of the land, you know, different organizations working on land rights. Mm -hmm. um, and partly it's about, um, I think these, these NGOs are motivated by a recognition that struggles over land continue to result in violence and land disputes and displacement of people, you know, and people being dispossessed. So it's very much a kind of a live issue, um, you know, impoverishing people and causing um, loss of life in, in Eastern Congo. But it's also because Congo is this paradox, um, as you know, I'm sure, because it, it is so rich in, um, yeah, in natural in resources. Yeah. Natural resources. As I yeah. said, it's a large country. Mm -hmm. um, it has, you know, large rivers. It has, um, uh, you know, most parts of it are relatively well watered and have a lot of rainfall. It has so much um, potential 
But at the same time, of course, there is mass mass poverty, and a lot of this is linked to, um, you know, lack of access to basic services like education, like healthcare, mm -hmm. but also lack of infrastructure, and lack of local governmental capacity. Right. So you have this situation where um, quite often the government, I think, and donors have especially the government has been pushing this idea of modernizing agriculture. Mm -hmm. It's been pushing the idea of um, mechanized agriculture. But in, in the mind of many policymakers in Congo, mm -hmm. that goes hand in hand with large scale land acquisition, large uh, kind of plantations. And that's very much kind of the model of, um, you know, colonial agriculture as well, right? This yeah, kind of yeah. large, you know, um, mechanized uh, agriculture, which is quite unfriendly to, you know, smallholder farmers, mm -hmm. to people who, you know, they don't have the money to buy tractors, they don't have the money to mechanize. So I think a lot of the NGOs are kind of supporting what they would see as um, peasant driven farming and agriculture and mm -hmm. the rights of peasants to continue to control land. Uh -huh. um, but at the same time, there is a bit of a paradox where also, you know, these same NGOs, of course, they want to see improvements in the quality of life uh, for smallholder farmers. They would like to see farmers having more money to perhaps spend on agricultural technologies as well. So there's this kind of, um, I would say, uh, a policy disconnect where the government quite often is kind of favoring, you know, larger scale landowners, those with access to credit. Um, to mechanize and to get all of these chemicals and things like that for industrial scale farming. Um, but a lot of these local community based organizations are saying, what about the vast majority of people who are too poor to follow this vision of industrialized agriculture mm -hmm. that certain donors and that the government is promoting? Yeah, because much of them, they are too poor that their concern is primarily subsistence agriculture. Uh, just to to provide for their families. In some places, um, again, you know, the east, as you know, is uh, on the border with uh, you know Uganda, Rwanda. Mm -hmm. So there are opportunities for export as well. Um, you know, and uh, things like coffee. There are many other products which can be very profitably grown. Uh, for example, in the east of, of the Congo. So I think that it's not only about subsistence. But it is partly about um, scale and just recognizing that, you know, small scale farmers have rights too. Mm. Now, looking at it, uh, looking at the history of it, you can see that uh, the Congo has had different forms of governments at different times. They have had uh, Lumumba, they have had Mobutu Saseseko, they have had uh, Laurent Desire Kabila, they have had uh, Joseph Kabila. And now they have Felix Tisekedi. How have these uh, successive different forms of government dealt with uh, the land question? You know, the main aspects are that in 1973, uh, Mobutu um, published this, this land law, uh, which is still on the books today. So the 1973 land law really is the one that continues to. Um, run things in terms of land in uh, Congo today. And um, essentially what that law did was to put all of the control into the hands of the, the state, of the government. So the, the state really is the ultimate landowner in Congo, mm -hmm. as is the case in some other countries as well, like Tanzania and, and others, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what that land law did was that it turned um, the customary system uh, which, you know, in Congo, as in many other African countries, is, you know, traditionally very strong, of course, it turned that customary system of chiefs and sub chiefs, etc, into um, an administrative role, and it really tried to take away the power mm -hmm. over land, which those chiefs had. So those chiefs were no longer really uh, responsible for um, administering land. They were seen as just government functionaries. Mm -hmm. And um, it kind of uh, disempowered the, the customary uh, leadership, right? Mm -hmm. But what happened was that as time went on, um, and partly because of, you know, towards the end of Mobutu's um, reign, uh, you know, economically things were very bad. 
um, people weren't getting uh, paid salaries, you know, civil ser uh, servants and things like that. And then, you know, in the 90s, you had conflict. So the land administration was not uh, really implemented, you know, uh, fully throughout the countryside. So the chiefs in practice continued to have some control over land, continued to make money. And quite often they made money as kind of middlemen in land deals, you know, and they, they continued to play kind of um, uh, a role as gatekeepers to land. Um, now, since um, the end of the, the conflicts in um, Eastern Congo, there have been a few um, laws put in place to try and uh, modify that situation. So for example, there was an agricultural law in 2011. Uh, there have been laws over forestry and all of these things do provide some uh, kind of modifications of the land law. Um, and they have tried to, for example, provide um, communities uh, within the forestry law. Communities now have more opportunities to um, basically claim land in their own name and to manage land kind of uh, communally, right? And this is in the interest, particularly of indigenous communities living in forests who can perhaps manage um, those forests more sustainably than commercial forestry companies can, right? Who have a, mm -hmm. um, a, a kind of a motivation just to, to clear cuts, whereas communities can perhaps manage those, those forests uh, better. So there are definitely some positive signs in terms of land governance and the kind of environmental governance which is linked to that in Congo um, since, let's say, 2005. Um, however, uh, a lot of these kinds of uh, decisions are made, and particularly a lot of these regulations are implemented at the provincial level, right? Because as I said, Congo is a big place. Now it has 26 different provinces and it has a highly decentralized governance model. Um, so in terms of you know, what is changing, um, it, it depends really on the political will at the provincial level and also the financial capacity and the institutional capacity at the provincial level for some of these changes to, to really kind of um, take place. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's quite complicated, but that's my brief kind of overview of what's happening. Do you think that uh, these land reform programs are an answer to the widespread poverty that is so prevalent and so predominant? Like a lot of people, I, I see um, land issues and especially disputes over land ownership and continued um, displacement of people because of land grabbing, sometimes by foreign companies, but also by domestic um, speculators, you know, people who, who acquire land and keep it kind of idle just as a, an asset um, for future use. Um, because of these things, people are being displaced. So that has an, an impact on, on conflict and politics. Uh, also, because of the, the lots of uh, disputes and the lack of security which people have over land, this also undermines um, food security, right? And despite all of this land and all of this uh, soil fertility and rainfall, there is, there is hunger and there is widespread food insecurity, particularly again in Eastern uh, DRC. Um, so I think land reform is key to the food security problem. Um, and also, you know, looking at uh, things like um, deforestation, environmental issues, land is important there as well. So um, just very briefly, I mentioned earlier that the Global Land Tools Network and UN Habitat is involved in this current land reform. Mm -hmm. So what has happened is that over the last uh, nine years now, um, the government of Congo has kind of invited UN Habitat to, um, to support a land reform process. Mm -hmm. And the stage that they're at now is having worked out kind of a roadmap for land reform, they are um, doing provincial level consultations, trying to uh, identify priorities for the land reform at the provincial level, because um, you know, the situation around Kinshasa, the capital in the West, you know, near the ocean is very different from the, the deep forests, you know, uh, mm -hmm. or from Kisangani, you know, where you have the diamond mines or mm -hmm. from, from North Kivu. A uh, very different situation. So they're doing these provincial level consultations, and then they want to um, develop a land law 
uh, a new land law and a new land policy based on those consultations. Mm. So I think that there is um, significant um, potential. Mm -hmm. I think that the worry, as always, is that um, either you know, this land reform will kind of be oriented to particular interests and especially the kind of what we might call agribusiness, you know, large commercial yeah, well-funded yeah. kind of business interests mm -hmm. rather than the interests of uh, small scale, uh, essentially peasant farmers. Um, or, which is also very likely that we might have uh, a nice looking land law, uh, which is not implemented and is not really put in place and operationalized across the country. Mm -hmm. um, so very briefly, what my uh, paper, you know, and, and again, mentioning my co-author, uh, Cristal Paluco Mastaki, what mm -hmm. we argue is that um, UN Habitat has used financing from um, Red Plus. And as I'm sure you know, Red Plus is the um, reduction of um, kind of eco ecosystem degradation and deforestation mm -hmm. um, program, right? A big UN program linked to, linked to uh, climate change efforts. There was quite a lot of money uh, for uh, Red Plus in the Congo. And Red Plus, as a, as a program, has found out that it can't really do a lot of uh, reforestation. It can't really safeguard forests without um, this issue of land tenure insecurity and conflicts over land being resolved. So UN Habitat has taken money from Red Plus and put it into this land reform. Mm -hmm. um, but the question then is, you know, will that tilt things, will that bias things towards forestry concerns and environmental concerns? Um, you know, how will that influence this land reform? So Again, at the risk of oversimplifying a very complex set of discussions, I would say that this land reform has a lot of potential, um, but uh, it really depends on the continued uh, political engagement of, on the one hand, the, you know, the Congolese government, but also UN Habitat being able to kind of balance these different interests, um, particularly on the basis of all this Red Plus uh, financing, which it has used to fund this uh, land reform. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Christopher Huggins. Viewers and listeners, this was Professor Christopher Huggins. He is with the School of International Development and Global Studies at the University of Ottawa. His article, The Political Economy of Land Law and Policy Reform in the Democratic Republic of Congo, was published by the Canadian Journal of Development Studies and can be accessed on the link that I'm going to paste right in the description panel on the upload for this video and in the comment sections on our Facebook page. Professor Chris, thank you very much for giving your time. It's a real pleasure. Thank you so much um, for, this, for this opportunity. Wonderful, thank you.